Hi, my name is Zach Ochoga, and I'm pastor of C6 Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I want to welcome you to our service online today. I want to also thank you for choosing to be with us in this service today. If you're a guest, thanks a lot for being here. If this is your very first time, thank you too for choosing to be with us today. Kindly let us know that you were here today at the end of this service by filling out our digital connection card that you'll be able to access right after this service or even in the cores of this service by simply texting CONNECT to the number below the screen, 605-468-2626. In a little bit here, my very good friend, Doug Hurt, will lead us in a couple songs, and then I'll be back to share with you what I believe God would have you hear today. See you in a bit. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of to your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I found you You called my name Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you call my name Oh, I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my 
called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day tired and weary come just as you are come and let his mercy heal your heart for God so loved his children that he gave his only son that we might be forgiven death has been over Welcome back. In case you did not join us earlier and you're just joining us, my name is Zach Ochaga, and I'm the pastor of C6 Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We're about to go into the teaching for today. And before we do, I would like to say a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege to share your word with my listeners today. Cause us to hear your word. Open our ears to hear your word. Prepare our hearts to receive your word. And may your word prosper in our hearts and lives. Do everyone listening today good, I ask. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
And everyone too says, Amen. We are in the third part of our series titled, Courage. Courage. And today, we're looking at the topic, Have the Courage to Lead. Have the courage to lead. I have a question for you. What fear is holding you back from being who God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do? I want to ask it again. What fear is holding you back from being who God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. If you've listened to me for a little bit, by now you should believe, you should know and believe that there are things that God wants you to be. There is who God wants you to be. And there are things that God wants you to do. And this year particularly, it's going to, it's going to still apply for the rest of your life, but particularly this year, If you're going to be who God wants you to be, you're going to do what God wants you to do, you'll need courage. You'll need courage. You'll need to identify the fear that holds you back and the courage to overcome that fear. Many of you may have heard this story and know this part of my life. As a young kid, my parents' marriage didn't work, and they parted ways. My mom had to start her life all over again. It was harder for her. She had to go back to school, get into college, get a degree, so she could get a better paying job. At a certain point, all five of us kids lived with her, and she raised us up. It was tough for her. I I gave her trouble for a period of time. Most of us gave her trouble for, for a period of time. And yet she had to raise us up in the fear of God. To know him, to serve him, to believe in him, to behave like followers of Jesus Christ. It took courage for that woman to raise five kids for the length of time that she had us. I think of, and maybe right now listening to me, you might be a single parent, probably even a single mom, raising up a kid, two kids, three kids. It takes courage to do that. And you have all the challenges that come that children bring, oh boy. I know how challenging it can be because I was raised by a single parent too. And now I have five kids of my own. (laughs) So I, I, I know what it is like, at least for the few years that I've had kids. What it is like to have kids and to raise them up. And, and, and even as parents, Holly and I, you know, Parents together raising up these kids. Many, it's, it, it takes courage for us to raise them up. Many times, you know, Holly and I will look at each other and say, how do single parents do it? How do they do it? When, one day I was talking with, one, with my brother and I said, how did mommy do it? How did mommy do it? Because it is hard work and many times a thankless job even when both parents are together and having a strong and healthy marriage. Now, I am sure that there are many ways in your life that you require, you need courage. You need to act in courage. If you're going to be who God wants you to be, if you're going to do what God wants you to do, and if you're going to lead as God would have you lead. I know many of you might be thinking, but uh, I'm not a leader. This, 
does not apply to me. Yes, it does. And I'm going to explain that a little bit. It applies to you. It applies to everyone. Because at a minimum, you need to lead yourself. You need to lead yourself. And it requires courage to lead yourself. Leading requires courage because you have to overcome fears and insecurities. Talk to me about that. Almost every day of my life, there are fears and insecurities that I have to overcome. I have to act in spite of those fears and in spite of those insecurities. What are your fears? What are your insecurities? Are you letting them hold you back? Or are you learning to act in spite of them? Leading requires courage because you have to confront unacceptable behavior and performance. You have to be a person of value. And you need to know the things that are not acceptable. You need to know the things that are not good enough but okay. And you need to know the things that are not accept acceptable, whether it's in your relationships, whether it's at your job, whether it's wherever in your life. And, and, and there comes a time that you have to confront behavior that is unacceptable. Sometimes it is behavior in yourself that you have to confront. Sometimes it is the behavior of others that you have to confront because it's unacceptable. Even as parents, I'm learning more and more that parenting is leadership, big time. We have to look at ourselves as parents and say, we can't do this as parents. It's not acceptable. And sometimes we look at our kids and tell them, this is not acceptable, you cannot do this. These are the things that make leadership difficult. Because you, you, you take the risk of, of your kids not liking you because you're taking a hard stance. Because you're confronting something, you know, that is not acceptable in your home. But you've got to do it despite how they feel. Leadership requires courage because you have to take risks and make difficult decisions. Nobody achieved anything of significance. Nobody became anyone of significance without taking risks. If you, if you are afraid of risks and you let that control your life, you would never Tap into the fullness of your potential. And this is why leading requires courage. Because it takes courage to take a risk. It takes courage to start something new. It takes courage to do something you've never done before or that no one has done before. It takes courage to make difficult decisions. To step into the unknown. Or to correct behavior that is unacceptable. One thing also that makes leadership require courage is because many times it is a thankless job. It is a thankless job. You know, many times leadership is not just about making an investment that will bring about a return in a few weeks or in a few months or even in a year. Many times the things that you do as a leader are not things that will bring back a reward immediately. Again, I think of parenting. How many times would your kids tell you thank you? That they really appreciate how you raise them. The choices and decisions that you're making today. It doesn't happen that quickly. Sometimes it is till the kids are adults that they show you how much they appreciate how you raise them up. It reminds me of a day that I felt moved by God 
to take my entire salary that I had, I had received and give it to my mom as a gift. That day, my, my mom was moved. She was so moved when I gave her my, my whole salary. And I imagine that that day, she saw part of the reward of how she raised me up. Not that the money I gave her could compensate or, you know, make up for all she had gone through and the tears that I had caused her while growing up. But it was an action that told her, you know what? You did the right things. You did your best and you did the right things. Sometimes as leaders, you don't really see the reward of what you do till after a decade. Or even decades. Now, are you going to decide that your leadership would, would be about just immediate returns? Or would you decide that, you know what, I'm not after immediate returns. I'm after eternal returns. There are some things as a leader, as a human being, following God, that you would never see rewards, you would never see the rewards till in, et in eternity. And you have to be content with that. You, have the, you, you need to have the courage to keep on knowing that what you're doing is right and of eternal value, even though right now you may not see the rewards. So wherever you are, Whatever your status is, I want you to know that God has given you some level of influence. And this is why I say each of you is a leader. You're all leaders at whatever level and whatever capacity that you're at. God has given you a level of influence. And the question is, what are you going to do with the influence and abilities that God has given you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with the influence and abilities that God has given you? Today we're going to see the story of two people and the level of influence that they have. But before we look at you know, that passage, I want you to do something. If you can write it, if you have the, the, the time, if you're not driving, you're not, you know, someplace, uh, or I, I imagine you shouldn't be driving since you're watching, right? You should be focused on your driving. If, if you're in a place where you can write, if you're in a place where you can write, then I want you to do this. But if you can't, just, just follow me here. Just follow me here. Draw a circle. Big enough to write the word you or write me in that circle. Just big enough for that to write me in that circle. And then after writing me in that circle, I want you to draw a line from that circle to another circle. And in that circle, write somebody that you know and you're in a relationship with. And I want you to, dr to draw as many lines as you can to other circles and put in names or relationships into those circles. So, for example, you could draw a line and then in that circle put your spouse. You could draw another line and in that circle put kid. And maybe you have five kids. You draw five lines and you write kid, 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 five kids. You could draw another line and put in a colleague of yours. You could draw another line and put in your neighbor. You could draw another line and put in a business partner. You could draw another line and put in some relative, grandpa, grandma, cousin, uncle, nephew. You get the idea. Now, all these people are people you have influence with. The degree of influence might vary from person to person, but you have influence with them. Then you could think of the people that you have the most influence with. Make sure you put them there. 
And maybe it's an organization. So, for example, I am pastor of C6. I could put C6 somewhere because I have influence with C6. I don't know how much influence I have, <laughs> but I have some. You know, so it, whatever it is, the relationship, put the name in there. Do you see? That is an idea of your network of relationships. God has given you some level of influence. Wherever you're at, whatever your status is. Now with this understanding, I'd like us to dive into our scripture that we would read for today. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. So this is God speaking to Joshua, telling him he would lead the nation of Israel. Next, Joshua 6, verses 24 and 25. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. That town is Jericho. All the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house. In the house. Because she had hidden the spies, Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among them, among the Israelites to this day. Here's the backstory of Joshua chapter 6, 24 and 25. Now, Jericho was a town or a city that God had promised to give the people of Israel. And so Joshua sent two spies to go and spy out the city or the town. And when they got in there, they got to the house of Rahab, a prostitute, a harlot. And she took them into her house and she hid them in her house because word got to the king that there were spies from Israel in the city. And so the king sent people to check, check that out in her house. And she said, oh, they've gone already. Meanwhile, she hid them. And she told them, she said, hey, I have heard, we've heard of the God of Israel, your God, and what he's done to other nations. And, 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 you know, people here are all scared because they know God is going to give this place to you guys. And she asked them, I said, I want you to remember me and my family. That we will not be hurt. And they said, yes, we give you our word. So that's the backdrop there. And so here, the day comes, uh, Jericho is destroyed, but Rahab and her family were not destroyed. So, two people that we see here, Joshua and Rahab. Joshua had a level of influence. He was leading a whole nation. His influence was huge. Rahab was a prostitute and... Her influence pretty much was with her family. Nevertheless, she had influence. Rahab had to act courageously. Every step of action Rahab took was a leadership step. And she had to act courageously because there were so many things that were against her. How did Rahab demonstrate courage in leading? Because we're talking about have courage, have the courage to lead. And we want to learn from Rahab. How did Rahab demonstrate courage in leading? Rahab demonstrated courage in leading by acting in spite or despite her stigma. She had the stigma of being a prostitute. Everybody knew her. Oh, that's the lady that everybody sleeps with. And who would have taken her seriously? She was very low, probably at the bottom of the social ladder 
in that country. But she did not let that stop her. You know, I, I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your stigma is. I don't know what it is that holds you back, that probably makes you ashamed of yourself. I don't know what it is that places you at the bottom of the ladder socially. And maybe you're letting that to stop you from taking actions to please God or taking actions to do what God wants you to do. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Don't let your stigma stop you back. You know, I've experienced stigma because my parents are separated. And boy, it hurt. But I've not let that stop me from pursuing the plans and purposes of God for my life. Rahab demonstrated courage because she tried something new. I mean, she's talking about a God that her country and her people do not serve. But she decided to believe that God and to make a commitment to that God. She tried something new. It had not been done before. She said, hey, I want you guys to spare me. I'm going to try to bring all my family into the house so you guys spare me. Many times, many people do not become the people God wants them to be or do the things God wants them to do because they are afraid of trying something new. Be like Rahab today. Be courageous enough to try something new. And finally, Rahab took a risk. She took a risk to hide the spies. Because if she had been caught, she may have been killed. The king may have ordered her death. She took a risk to say, okay, I'm going to try and save my family. Who knows whether the Israelites are going to succeed in getting this place, in, in taking over this city, and in truly saving me and my family. But she took the risk. What is that risk that you're afraid of taking? And yet it is the one barrier between you and the next level that God would have you get to. Be courageous and take the risk. So here's what I want to say to you. One, one, one big thought that I have for you today in this teaching is this. Build and use your influence for God's glory. Build and use your influence for God's glory. And I want to just show you two ways that you could have courage to lead and that you could build and use your influence for God's glory. The first is this. Be committed to Christ and his mission on earth. Be committed to Christ and his mission on earth. In C6 Church, our number one commitment is to Jesus Christ. That's our number one commitment. And you could look up all six of our commitments and see that number one for us is a commitment to Jesus Christ. And you may go, but how did, how did Rahab... <laughs> show commitment to Jesus Christ. Here's how she did. Rahab showed commitment to God by hiding the spies. She believed in their God and what had been said about their God and that he was going to destroy the city that she lived in and give it over to the people of Israel. She believed that. And so her act of commitment to him was hiding those spies how you treat the people that serve and represent God will show your level of commitment to God I want to show you a passage in the Bible of someone who persecuted the church and let's see what lesson we can learn from that Acts chapter 9 verses 4 through 5 it says, he fell to the ground, that is Paul, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, 
the one you are persecuting. So Saul persecuted the church. The Apostle Paul, then known as Saul, persecuted the church. But when Jesus appeared to him, Jesus did not say, hey, why are you persecuting the church? Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? In other words, Christ. So the church represents Christ. How you treat the church is how you treat Christ. How you treat the church shows your commitment level to Christ. The church is the body of Christ. So when you touch the church, you touch Christ. And Christ also has a mission on earth. Just like God had a mission to give the people of Israel, you know, territory, Jesus has a mission on earth. His mission is to save the world. And when you are committed to his mission, you are committed to Christ. Are you a part of the body of Christ? That is his church. Are you a part of his mission on earth? So one way that you could lead courageously, have the courage to lead, is by being committed to Christ and to his mission. One way that you can build your influence, you can build your influence and use your influence to God's glory, is by being a part, being committed to Christ and to his mission on earth. So the second way that you can build your influence and use your influence for God's glory is to be committed to the people God has called you to. Be committed to the people God has called you to. There are people that God has called you to. There are people that God has already placed in your life. And then there are also people that God has not placed in your life He's yet to place in your life, but he wants you to reach out to them because they're not yet in your life. And we need to find the balance between those that are already in our life and those that God wants us to reach out to. God wants us to be committed to both. And I want to show you quickly a few scriptures about this tension between the people who are already in our lives and those that God wants us to reach out to. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Timothy says, Paul says, But those who wouldn't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have de denied the true faith. Such people are, are worse than unbelievers. So, your family, your relatives, are one group of people that God has already put in your life. And God has called us to take care of them. God has called us to minister to them and to serve them and if we don't do that we are worse than unbelievers so if i don't take care of my family for example i am worse than an unbeliever that's what the bible teaches L let's see another passage first corinthians 7 32 through 34 paul says i want you to be free from the concerns of this life an unmarried man can spend his time doing the lord's work and thinking how to please him but a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. So what I want you to see from this passage is that we have responsibilities to the people that God has placed in our lives. While this context is a context of marriage, it applies to anybody that God has put in our lives. We have a responsibility, responsibility to them. However, God does not want us to be just focused on the people that he has placed in our lives right now. He wants us to also be focused on the people that he has not yet placed in our lives right now, but wants us to reach out to. So let's look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go, he says. He doesn't want us to stay put and be comfortable in our present relationships. There are relationships he wants us to build. There are people he wants us to reach for him and make them disciples and teach them what he has taught us and baptize them. So this means that we, we, this tension of I need to focus on my family and those people that I already know and the, the people that are already in church and come to church that I know, I need to focus on these people. Yes, but don't just stay focused on them. He wants you also to be focused on others that you've not even met yet. He wants you to take steps to building relationships and bridges with others so that you could take his mission to, to the ends of the earth so that you could make disciples of them. So do you see? God wants you to be committed to the people that he has called you to. And some of them are in your life right now and some are yet to be in your life waiting for you to reach out to them, build a relationship with them, bridge and bridges with them, and they become a part of your life. All I'm saying this moment is this. Build and use your, relation, your, your influence starting where you're at. Build and use your influence to the glory of God, for the glory of God starting where you're at. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, God wants you to build relationships with people and share the gospel. Share the good news of what Jesus came and did and what he has done for you. And if you're listening to me and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you, build relationships with, with people and simply serve them. And simply serve them. When it comes to the time that you finally put your, you turn over your heart and your life to Christ, then you can begin to share the gospel with them. So there are two powerful ways that you could do this right now in C6 Church. And I don't know, you might be watching and you, you know, you're in some other church. You, you, could, you could do it too. There are two powerful ways that you can do this right now in C6 Church. Building and using your influence. One is by serving our kids. By serving our kids. The kids that come to C6 Church. We have kids that are in C6 Church right now and we have kids that will come to C6 Church. And if you decide to serve our kids by serving in our kids ministry you would be building influence with those kids and by extension their families and you would be using that influence that you have and the abilities God has given you for his glory because you'd be teaching those kids truths that will change and transform their lives. It's a job that may be thankless, but maybe 10 years from today, 20 years from today, some of these kids are going to remember you. And you might remain one of the greatest influences in their lives. I still remember people that discipled me as a kid in church. I still remember them like yesterday. So would you, if you have a heart for kids, if you have a heart for kids, and more important than even having a heart for kids, if you want to use your influence, build your influence, and use your influence for the glory of God, would you serve in our children's ministry? The second way, powerful way that you could put this to work right now in C6 Church is this. We want people to go out and own a block own a certain area, own a certain area of town, and go and meet people in that area face to face. Face to face. When you meet somebody once, their fences might be up. You meet them a second time, it might come down a little bit. After a few times, they get to trust you, and you would have built a relationship. Who knows what God would do with it? I, I'm going to explain this a little bit more, <laughs> you know, 
in, our, in one of our in-person services. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Build your influence and put it to work for Jesus Christ. Thank you for being a part of this service today. You have the opportunity to continue to support the ministry of C6 Church. If you want to do that, all you need to do is to go online, as is shown below the screen, go online and give. Or you could simply text the number, give. Text the word give to the number below the screen. And we thank you for your generosity to God and to C6 Church. I pray that you have a great week. A good week. A week that gives you so many reasons to be thankful. And may the God of peace go with you wherever you go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye.